Hello, welcome to the second sort of section of, uh, of the lectures as part of Bio 4253, which is Principles of Ecology. Um, and so we've covered so far the idea of what is ecology as well as um, sort of, what do we got? Population level processes. We've covered exponential model, logistic model, um, and a bit, a, bit, a bit about structured population modeling. And so things like the life tables and things like that. Um, only some of that is in the YouTube lectures. Uh, only the, the, the structured population modeling we went over in class, I believe, if I did this right. And so today I'd like to cover um, stochasticity and the role of individual behavior. And so up until this point, we've assumed that all individuals within a population have the same probability of death, have the same probability of birth, and therefore all individuals within a population are equivalent. Um, this is a big assumption, and it's an assumption we can't often make. The readings for this week, um, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. We can go from there. Um, I'm just going to sort of work my way through the notes with some R code that will hopefully be clear. Um, so we can zoom out. Here we go. Um, the readings for this week are causes and consequences of dispersal in plants and animals. And this is a sort of general um, introduction slash soft review to, um, to dispersal and uh, individual variation um, in dispersal. I think it mainly goes over sort of dispersal syndromes um, in the sense like passive versus active dispersal, which we'll talk about today. Um, and then this Boyce paper is the second paper, and that focuses more on um, stochasticity and the role of individual variation in determining population trajectories, uh, which is the sort of first part of this lecture, and that's what it will mainly focus on. Okay. Um, so like I said, our models before when we had like the sort of exponential model and the logistic model of population growth, we made a lot of assumptions. Uh, first and foremost being that all individuals contribute equally to the population size. We can't really assume that. If you think about it, um, we wouldn't expect that um, a organism that is very young would be able to reproduce with the same uh, clutch size or the same like uh, frequency as somebody or as an adult who's more established and is reproductively mature. Um, and so these are things that we sort of built in using stage structure, but that still put individuals within bins, right? And so within each bin, we're assuming that all individuals are equal. So there's no randomness there. There's no real, uh, we can't get at uncertainty in the population trajectory, which is a fundamental problem because um, population, traje that population trajectories are sort of inherently uncertain and stochastic. And I've used that word a bunch already, and I, I haven't defined it. And so that's where we're start. And that's the sort of focus of today's lecture is on these two things, stochasticity and dispersal. And so stochasticity um, is basically just the inherent randomness that, it, that generates from either a probabilistic process of birth and death which we'll go into what that means, or the inherent variability, the temporal variability in environmental conditions, which can influence all individuals within a population equally, but change through time. Let's identify and, and dive into that first one a little bit more. So that first one, the, the probabilistic nature of birth and death is called demographic stochasticity. I'm highlighting it here. If we, wanted to run an experiment and we wanted to know how a population would grow in a laboratory microcosm, we could take 20 individuals of whatever we're studying in this microcosm, put them in their environment, control all the variables. Um, and if we ran that experiment among 100 replicates, we wouldn't expect to see the same exact population trajectories, right? But why not? If it's not environmentally determined, and if we have the same putative growth rate, all, we're assuming all these individuals are equal, what's actually going on that's causing all that variation? Arguably, it's demographic stochasticity, right? And because um, individuals 
are whole numbered. Right? So if you can, you have 20 individuals to start, but you can't have 19.2 individuals. A lot of the continuous models sort of assume that you can have these and they sort of are approximate things. Um, just the same, uh, a birth event can either happen or not happen. You can't have 0.5 birth events. And so when we went and we had these, these very smooth transitions um, in population trajectories in the exponential model and the logistic model, that's not really maybe how it works. And so um, how maybe survival or reproduction really works is at some time T, you have every individual in a population has a probability of dying or giving birth. And then demographic stochasticity could be incorporated um, one of two ways. Actually, the first way I talk about, let's not even assume that uh, individuals vary in their probability of birth and death. Let's just say that individuals vary in the amount of offspring they have, right? And so when we think of things like dogs, they have a bunch of puppies. Like in the movie, 101 Dalmatians, there was a huge clutch size. They had 101 Dalmatians. <laughs> um, in real life, we don't see the clutch sizes that big, um, but still there's, there's variation. And I guess it's litter size is more appropriate for them. Um, and a lot of times that variation in litter size could be attributed to a specific distribution. And so oftentimes uh, I say the most common distribution to use would be the, the Poisson distribution, which is a count distribution. Um, I can show you how that looks just really quick. Here's my coffee. Um, so this was what, did I do that right? Oh, of course not, because my R has been breaking. I should have thought this ahead and, and, and typed it out beforehand, but now you're just watching me weirdly code on the fly. I could also just like look it up, but you know what? That's no fun. Here we go. It's pulling it in. That's sort of what the Poisson distribution looks like. And let's make it even more Poisson E. Why is it determining the number of breaks itself? Basically, what you see is it's a count distribution with this has a mean of three. And so you see some that have very low, but you see this long tail. So this is called a right skewed distribution. Um, yeah, that's not, it's neither here nor there. Uh, but this is sort of what the Poisson distribution would look like. So imagine that every individual that gave birth, they, they pulled probabilistically from this distribution. So the majority of individuals in that population would have, I don't know, like two or three offspring, but you'd have rare events of six or more offspring. That is one way to incorporate demographic stochasticity or one form of demographic stochasticity that you could incorporate into a model. The second form would be to consider birth and death a probabilistic process that it is, meaning every individual has some probability of dying and some, we'll call it D, and some probability of giving birth B. Okay, so B and D. Um, this process sort of results in, in some sort of whole number addition or subtraction to the population. It's easiest to think about death is death is just you lose one individual. So an individual can either be alive or dead. And this is determined at each time step by a Bernoulli process. Bernoulli process just means a coin flip. So with some probability P, we flip a coin and with the, some probability P, it's heads, death, some probability one minus P, you're okay. You've, you've escaped alive for this time step. Um, and so this would be a second way to introduce stochasticity and uh, would influence or would introduce uh, individual variation. Um, one thing, all right, so I, I wanted to make sure that I uh, am going through this right. Um, so one thing to note is that demographic stochasticity will inherently influence small populations disproportionately. Right, and we can see this, we, or we can sort of think through it first, and then I'll, I'll show you some plots and we can sort of 
get at this a little bit better. And we might have to sort of dive more into this during the discussion on Thursday, um, but we'll go over it sort of briefly now. So if every individual in a population has some probability of birth and death, um, you have, as population becomes large enough, you swamp all that variation out, right? So let's say I flip a coin and I'm only flipping it five times. There's a, there's a huge parameter space. There's a huge number of heads and tails that I can uh, achieve with just five flips. If I keep flipping that coin, let's say I flip that coin a thousand times, it's going to converge to the true probability of success. Meaning like in, in the case of a, a, a normal coin with a probability of a heads at 0.5, it's going to say you're going to get 500 heads out of the thousand attempts um, and you're going to get 500 tails. This is unlikely to happen when you only flip five times. It's actually impossible to happen, right? Because five, you can't have, it would be two and a half times it's a heads and two and a half times it's tails, which is not really how that works. And we can see this, apart from just thinking about it conceptually, we can see this bore out in um, population time series or, or trajectories. And so um, I've coded up the exponential model. Um, and I've done so in a way where we treat birth and death as probabilistic processes. Birth and death occur with equal probability. I've set this randomly, I've set it at 0.5. It doesn't have to be, it can be whatever, but birth and death are equal. In the exponential model and the logistic model, when birth rate is equal to death rate, the population is ju it just stagnates, right? It just maintains. So that time series is just a flat line. If you have the X, we have time. On the Y, we would have the population size. It would just be straight line, keep it on with initial conditions. Um, but here we're, I'm assuming that birth happens, every individual in the population has some probability B of giving birth, which I've set at 0.5, and has some probability D of death, set, also set at 0.5. And so I flip a bunch of coins. I'm going to run it now. I have the initial population size set at 100. I'm simulating for 500 time steps. I'll move this down here in case that is distracting. And here's what I see. Population size on the y-axis. I started with 100 individuals. And here's my time as it goes up to 500. I'm, it looks sort of exponential, right? There's, but there's noise. Like there's noise that we didn't see before. And noise just meaning it's not that beautifully perfect curve because we're dealing with whole numbers now. When we're not only dealing with whole numbers, we're, we're dealing with probabilistic outcomes. What this means functionally is if I run this code again, this plot will look different, right? Let's try it. And that looks look quite different. You actually have this sort of spike and then a downturn. This downturn would not be expected in a standard exponential model. Then we can run it again and it looks completely different where it almost actually goes extinct. It goes down to 20 individuals around sort of maybe time step 25 or 30 and then recovers to 120. And what's funny is like this is sort of what actually time series of, of animal populations actually look like. And so it's that incorporation of that realism um, that I think is really, really important. And so we let's run this a bunch of times. There we go, we had extinction. And so after 290, 300 time steps, this population goes extinct. And we can see that's another extinction. This is a sort of almost looks cyclic, but it's not because this is memoryless essentially, um, meaning that B and D don't change as a function of time. The only thing that influences the previous state is the, the one state before. It doesn't really have any memory. They go extinct. They're bouncing around a bunch. Extinction, extinction. Looks, uh, I don't know, they look pretty good. But now let's see what happens when we, when we reduce the population size down to just 10 individuals. And we run the same thing, but instead of starting at 100 individuals, now we're just starting at 10 individuals. Immediate crash. This is by 10 time steps, the population's extinct. By 210, 20 time steps, it's extinct. By 160 or so, it's extinct. 
by time step like 10 it's extinct. And so we're seeing way more extinction way faster. I'm trying to get to one where we actually see persistence with persistence being defined here as just not hitting a zero population size during the time window one through 500. And I could just sit here all day. Oh, oh we got it, we're gonna say, we're gonna say, so we got two that actually persisted um, and grew till, uh, till they almost hit around 100, 100 or so individuals. And so this demonstrates two things. This demonstrates the influence of stochasticity on population dynamics, at least demographic stochasticity. And it also demonstrates that small populations are more prone to extinction given demographic stochasticity. All right, hopefully that was informative. And now we're going to talk about a different form of stochasticity that I don't have code written up for, and it may be prohibitive for me to just like write it on the fly. So I think we're just gonna talk our way through this one. Um, and that's environmental stochasticity. Uh, and so environmental stochasticity assumes, it doesn't necessarily assume, you could have all individuals be equal in a population and not even incorporate any sort of, of, of demographic stochasticity like we did and just incorporate environmental stochasticity and you'll still see things that are similar to what I just showed you. Environmental stochasticity is a sort of temporally dependent stochasticity. What do I mean by that? I mean that population parameters, things like birth and death that we considered were static, now change with time. And it's that change through time that causes uh, populations to fluctuate. So let's say um, we draw birth rate randomly from a normal distribution. So a normal distribution just looking like a, a sort of bell curve. It's a symmetric distribution with some mean mu and some variation around its sigma. Um, this would be incorporating um, demographic, sorry, environmental stochasticity. I almost want to just do it right now. I could just do it right now. You know what? In bad influence, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to code it up really quick. Um, and so I'm, what I'm doing is I'm coding up. Uh, okay, I think that'll work. What I'm doing now is coding up an exponential model in which I do that very thing. I consider um, a population size of n with a growth rate, so the composite of birth minus death, to be drawn from the normal distribution with mean one and um, standard deviation of 0.1. So it can sort of vary in between those in between like around like 0.7 and 1.2 or so. Um, and it does so at each time step. So we start at time step one, and let's say we have a population growth rate of 1.1. This is being, this would be lambda, um, not a little r, if we remember, we recall from our last lecture. Uh, let's say it's one. So the population should just cover itself basically. Um, and then at the next time step, due to environmental causes, so due to something like precipitation, solar radiation, something like that, all of a sudden we have a growth rate of 0.75. And we'll see how that looks. And so we'll do the same thing as we did before, starting with a population size of 100 individuals. This is the uh, previous plot where we had demographic stochasticity acting and uh, starting with 10 individuals. So it's going to change. And this is what happens. And so this is incorporating environmental stochasticity. And you'll see it actually looks sort of like really reminiscent to demographic stochasticity. And so you have sometimes when the population goes and crashes, you have sometimes when it sort of quasi cycles. So it looks like it spikes then goes down, even though there's nothing stopping it from going to infinity, right? The only thing stopping it from going to infinity is the fact that growth rate half of the time is less than one. Right, because remember this this distribution that I'm pulling from is symmetric, and so the mean is one. The mean is is status is just replacing the population. But if I go to this side of the distribution, I'm less than one. My population will tend towards zero. It'll tend toward extinction. If I'm on this side of the distribution, then my population will tend toward infinity. It will grow and grow and grow. And we can keep. We can keep running that and see a bunch of different shapes and variation. Cool, 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 cool. 
nice, nice, nice. And then we can do the same thing that we did before, right? So we had demographic stochasticity. We started with a population size of 100. It did the thing, varied over the time of 500 steps. And then we did population size 10, and we saw that populations went extinct way more rapidly, it seemed, due to this probabilistic birth death process. And now we can reduce, so now we're looking at environmental stochasticity. We can do the same thing. Let's start with, so we started with 100 individuals. We see some fade out, we see some, some dynamics, some bounciness to it. Some things go extinct. What happens when we only start with 10 individuals? So here we have the population going extinct, 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 but like bouncing around, extinct, but like it's not crashing as much as it was, right? When we incorporated in, uh, demographic stochasticity, we saw populations crashing really, really fast. When we incorporate uh, environmental stochasticity, we don't see that. This one looks like it gets really big. That one's hit the jackpot. This is because environmental stochasticity does not depend on the population size. Because the, the growth rate affects all individuals of the population equally, it does not depend. Meanwhile, demographic stochasticity is inherently related to population size because we're treating each individual as a probabilistic event. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, we'll go over more of that in, uh, in lecture and sort of and talk that through. Yeah, and so here I introduce that term, density dependent. Density dependent things depend on the density of the species there. So demographic uh, stochasticity is density dependent. Um, environmental stochasticity is not density dependent. And then I give an example. The effect of, of environmental stochasticity is the same in small and large populations, which we saw is not true for demographic stochasticity as we have implemented it. And I could also implement it. Maybe I'll do that in class. I'll do the, the Poisson birth process, but it looks it looks pretty similar. It'll look the same. It, we'll, we'll see some square holes. We'll see some bounces, but uh, population size matters. Okay. Um, and now I'm going to change gears and we're going to talk about dispersal a little bit. And so I, I lumped these two topics together because I think they're fundamentally related to the individual level of the population. And specifically, it's, it's about individual variation in behavior. Uh, and so demographic stochasticity is individual processes such as, as birth death. That, that's a, an individual thing. I would argue that dispersal behavior is also an individual process. I am right here. I can choose to move over here, or I could choose to stay put. I do that with some probability, um, such that dispersal is sort of inherently an individual level process. Uh, I hope nobody gets mad at that, because I don't know, I feel like some people treat it as population level. Um, but first, let's back up and sort of <clears throat> define dispersal as we, uh, as we will talk about it. Uh, here I define dispersal as the movement of individuals in a way that allows gene flow. I don't know if that's a great of a definition, but it has to be outside of the normal home range, right? So when I said like, I'm right here and I moved over here, is that dispersal? No, it's not really dispersal because I'm not moving outside of my home range. I'm still in my office, which is like my native habitat. Um, although last lecture was recorded at my home. Um, but the lighting here is better. I got a microphone set up. I don't know. It'll be a mix. Um, so yeah, and the idea of the home range is it's like the set of environments um, or geographic locations where an individual normally goes for its day-to-day -day tasks, where it goes to eat, where it goes to sleep, where it goes to do whatever. Um, sometimes also, it's like a territory. It's like this individual's territory. When it goes beyond that and then stays beyond that, it's a dispersal event. And many organisms disperse as soon as they're born, right? When you think about that, like it's uh, like a, mm, small mammals do it, snakes do it. And so they're, um, once they're born, there's this sort of natal dispersal where they go out and find their, their new range. Um, 
Yeah, and and so this is uh, and there I focused on, on on things that actively disperse, but I think many times when we think about dispersal, it's actually about plants, um, and so sedentary or sessile organisms also must disperse, obviously, um, and they do that in a in a variety of ways, which uh, the paper, the Nature Knowledge paper, I think it is. Um, yeah, it's causes and consequences of dispersal. It goes over pretty nicely. It's a little bit plant biased, but it's good. All right. Um, if I remember correctly, it's plant biased. I'm pretty sure it's plant biased. It's okay. And so I think I, I accidentally just sort of briefly introduced these concepts, but um, thinking about dispersal, we can sort of delineate dispersal as either active dispersal or passive dispersal. Active dispersal, meaning I'm an individual, I'm going to move to my new habitat, I go. The example I give is a mouse moving into a new burrow that's outside of its normal home range. Um, passive dispersal, meanwhile, is when an individual or propagule slash seed, whatever, um, moves into a new habitat with uh, assistance from something else. It's not really moving by its own volition. And so things um, like there we go, highlight it, wind, water, or animal assistance. And so there's tons of examples of this, especially in the plant literature. And so when we think of wind pollinated stuff, we can think of like things like cattails, if you've seen those, it's like a marsh plant that has really wispy pollen. They're really wispy seeds that just get carried off. Or dandelions is another good example. When we think about water dispersal or, or uh, water mediated passive dispersal, we can think of things like uh, fungi. A lot of fungi are passively dispersed through water. Um, there's a bunch of water transmitted pathogens, actually, but we won't go into that. That's maybe a, a, an odd way to think about dispersal, but it's still dispersal. Um, for instance, in Florida, citrus canker is this, I think it's bacterial pathogen of citrus. And uh, wind and water are two main ways that it moves around orange groves. And so hurricane will come through and it actually happened, I think in uh, 2017 or 2016, hurricane came through and actually increased rates of citrus canker because with all the wind and all the water, it actually was able to, do, to move all those spores, all those I guess, bacteria from infected plants and throw them so like far and wide and actually encourage or enhance dispersal in a way that enhanced disease, not ideal. And then lastly, the sort of animal assistant assistance, either like sort of sticking to the animal as it walks by or in the case of like fruits. And so many times a fruit is like a nice delicious sweet thing. It attracts a, uh, a frugivore, meaning an animal that would eat fruit it eats it, poops out the seeds, and then the seeds propagate from there. And so that is a form of dispersal as well, this animal mediated dispersal. Uh, here I talk a little bit about zooplankton, which are kind of cool. They can uh, be dispersed by animals or wind. They form this little uh, encrusted cyst as like an egg, and then um, animals can actually pick them up and move them in a sort of like in the mud, or like duck feet. Um, or also can be wind dispersed, meaning like when if a pond dries up, there could be Daphnia cysts or Aphibia, I guess they're not really called cysts, at the bottom of a lake that gets swept away it, and then um, inhabits some land that when it rains or gets wet again, the, and the, the timing is right, the cues are right, the, the Daphnia will um, be born. I don't know what's a good hatch. Is it hatch? <laughs> emerge. I don't know what the best word is there, but the, the Daphnia will come into being. How about that? Oh, I do mention sort of water droplets or rain events. Yeah, and here I, I sort of talk about the difference between dispersal and migration. And so if this were in class, I would like have, we can talk about what's the difference between them and we can really get at it. And so we, when we think about migration, we probably think of um, monarch butterflies or some birds that sort of, we think of those like Cornell migration maps, which if you haven't seen, I'll show you in class, they're fantastic. But it basically shows like the flyways where animals are, are basically tracking their environments or moving between breeding and, um, and non-breeding sites. 
but that's different fundamentally from dispersal, right? And so, and at, at least I would argue this. Um, and so I'm, I'm defining dispersal as the individual-based process of movement, often involving the movement of young away from their parents, but not necessarily. It is a, uh, a sort of one-time movement and it's not to track environmental conditions largely. On the other hand, I would define migration as the movement of a large number of individuals from one place to another, either following climate or um, to sort of find a breeding ground and or tracking a resource. Okay, so there's a bunch of nuance here, right? My, I'm saying dispersal, individual level process. It could be density dependent. My probability of dispersing could be a function of the density of individuals at a given site. Still, dispersal is an individual level process. Migration is not individual level process. It's a bunch of individuals moving together or roughly together um, to follow either a climate cue or a resource cue. Um, and so I give some examples of, of sort of what I would consider more migratory species uh, versus, I don't know if cicadas is a good example. I might strike that and think of a better example for that one. Um, but yeah, hopefully that's clear. If not, we can talk about it more during class. And anybody watching this lecture, if you disagree with me, feel free to toss something in the comments and we can settle it and get to the bottom of, uh, of my confusion. So dispersal, as we've defined it now, sort of can have um, different phases as we'll define them here. And so, I'm in a current location. In order to disperse, I must do three things. Departure is the first one. I must leave the current habitat with the intention to travel somewhere new. The second one is transfer. That's, um, let's say I'm going to go anywhere between uh, 300 meters to 5,000 meters away from my habitat currently. That's outside my home range. That's the transfer part. That's the actual movement. And then lastly, we have settlement. That means once I, I completed this sort of transfer, I have to actually establish myself in the new habitat. If I, in the middle of my journey, die, I haven't dispersed. I've tried to disperse. I've gotten past the departure stage. I've gotten maybe halfway in or some percentage into the transfer phase, and I have not made it to the settlement phase. Uh, and yeah, that's what I said here. This means that dispersal is not just the movement of an of a individual from one place to another, but is the movement with survival and establishment. I don't know if that's that important of a distinction, but it is a distinction that I'm going to make. <laughs> um, okay, and now I'm gonna talk about the cost of dispersal. Okay, okay, I see where I'm going, so I'm, making sure that I'm covering things. All right, we actually have a lot to go through. Some of this might be best talked about in the um, in class on Thursday. I'm still gonna go through it now and I may just go through it a little more briefly and then points of confusion can be addressed on Thursday. That might be a good way to do this. Um, so these, these different phases, departure maybe doesn't really come at a cost um, but some of these phases come at a cost, right? So like the transfer, that, that's a huge cost in terms of energetics. I have to actually self-propel if I'm, if this is not passive dispersal, I have to, if this, I'm assuming this is active dispersal. I have to self-propel to get to this new area. If you're passively dispersed, you don't really have much say in the dispersal process. But the, the idea of a dispersal kernel, which I'll talk about in a second, is still appropriate for passive and active dispersed organisms. Um, and so sort of how I showed that sort of Poisson distribution, if you remember that from earlier this lecture, where it, it sort of increased from zero, came to the, the mean, where the mean was like three, and then it had that long tail. 
that's sort of what a dispersal kernel looks like sometimes. They look mainly like more negative exponential, but we can think about it as, 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 as that distribution. And so let's say you have um, the distance that an organism will travel away from its natal or natal or whatever, its, its old habitat as an x-axis. And then on the y-axis, you have um, the some like sort of probability or frequency of, of that occurrence. So if you're right, if you're really early on in the graph, say you're right here, it's that means that you're gonna only gonna travel 10 units away from wherever you were. You may do that really often, so you have really high frequency. And then you go, but if you go further on in that tail, what's the what's the sort of frequency or probability of an individual dispersing? 2,000 units, it's really, really low. And so if you fill in the curve in between there, it follows a negative exponential, where most of the time dispersal occurs in this band where it's fairly short distance dispersal. And yet it's those really long distance dispersal events that are actually super duper important when we think about invasive species or species establishing in a new habitat. And so, um, that snail has to get across that road or has to get over that mountain range. And it's not gonna do it that often, right? A hundred, more than that. The majority of the time that snail is only gonna move or individuals of that snail population are only gonna move 10 units, but it sort of maybe to establish in an area where it could survive, but it's just not found there. It needs to move that 2000 units. So those, those rare processes or rare events are super important to, uh, to establishing new areas. I think that'll make more sense when we talk about species niche, which is gonna be next week. But I think conceptually we can sort of get, get our heads around that. Here I introduce a little bit about neutrality. I don't really wanna go in that. Maybe I will, whatever, I will. We'll go into it maybe more in, um, in class. So much like demographic stochasticity, where I assume that every individual has a probability B or D of birth and death respectively, neutral dispersal would mean that every individual in a population has some probability of dispersing. Here, I'm defining it as one probability, or the, um, or the probability of dispersing one unit distance. This is sort of like a, I don't wanna go into that. This is a little bit of a silly assumption. I see how I'm doing it. Okay, I'm using this as a way to create the negative um, exponential dispersal kernel. Dispersals don't really work like this, but let's let's uh, actually as a word argument, let's say that it does. Every individual has the same probability of dispersing, um, but that probability, let's call it p. It's the probability that an individual disperses one unit distance away. Let's also assume that dispersal or the landscape is a one dimensional, meaning it's a line. So here's where the population starts. Here's the total number of sites. And then there's like sort of individual units along this single line. Here I'm, I'm just saying I have a, a linear landscape is the same thing as a one dimensional landscape. And let's say we have 10 sites. And we have individuals that start at this site and uh, need to go to this site. With each um, unit, they do so with probability p, such that the probability of getting to two sites away, which I'm saying is here, is the probability of getting to one site times the probability of getting to the other site. So it's just p squared to get to patch, I guess that'd be two or the end, they're two units away. And then if we plot that out, that would it would just be the negative exponential distribution because you'd start off and most of the time you'd only go one unit, but vanishingly rare number of times you'd be able to go 10 units. Because you can think about the probability of getting to patch um, to getting 10 units away is P to the 10, which I, I sort of word confusingly here. I'll try to change that before. Um, before the class starts, or, or we'll just sort of go into it in a little more detail. But I hope that um, that makes a bit of sense. And a neutral dispersal is not something that um, that many people would agree that is a thing. 
you know, there was like a paper uh, less than 10 years ago that was like, it's not a thing. And most of the time we realize that it's not a thing because um, informed dispersal makes way more sense. If you're going to undertake something so costly as dispersal to a new habitat, you wanna make sure that uh, you're using cues from the environment to be like, this is a good habitat, not this is a bad habitat. All right, and so now we're gonna talk a little bit about informed dispersal. Informed dispersal is when, I would actually still say that, so I say when individuals use information on their own density, I don't even know if I would call that informed dispersal. I would say it's density dependent dispersal. It's not necessarily informed. However, using information like social information, um, like sort of, oh, there's a really good patch of, of resource over there. And you're that sort of, like your friend tells you, and you're like, oh, I should disperse there. That's using social information um, or the density of a competitor or predator. If you can sense that and basing your dispersal on that, that's informed dispersal. And so, yeah, things like water availability, uh, resource availability, available nesting sites, things like that. Um, yeah, so we would think that like social cues from neighbors, if you heard, if you're a bird and you heard a bunch of birds chirping and they were saying, we're happy over here. You can hear us, we're happy. This is outside your range, but like it, it's cool over here. If you disperse there, that's informed dispersal because you're using those social cues. Um, yeah, I talk a little bit about informed dispersal and flower beetles. Flower beetles are something I did for my postdoc um, at UC Davis, um, where basically I found that dispersal was influenced by the density of a competing species of flower beetle, suggesting that species interactions were able to control dispersal behavior, um, which suggests that um, dispersal is is informed to some extent in this, even in a simple system like, like flower beetles. Um, also, and this was published, I think, in a journal called the Journal of Animal Ecology fairly recently. I think within the last year is like this crazy, this, this is a really interesting amount of individual variation and in dispersal behavior. And for that, we sat there and painted beetles a certain color let them disperse across a landscape and then put them back in that patch and then let them disperse again and then put them back in that patch and let them disperse again over a course of I think 10 to 15 days. And then we got at the actual, that probability of dispersal, right? So the, the probability that they will move one patch away or any patches away, n patches away. Um, and it varies as a function of individual, meaning some individuals, when you put them in there, will just stay put for the entire 10 days or 15 days that they have to potentially disperse. And other individuals, as soon as you put them in, they're like, time to disperse every day, time to disperse, time to disperse, um, which I think is really nice. And so that's the last part of the lecture that I'll go into is um, that individual variation in dispersal behavior. And Oh yeah, okay. So now I'm talking about um, environmental and individual effects on dispersal behavior, right? So when we introduced the dispersal kernel, we said it's the same for all individuals in the population. The dispersal kernel is not something at the individual level, but is something that is attributed to a population or even a species. Um, but that, that ignores um, uh, a little bit of variation or a little bit of nuance and it ignores three things. First, as I sort of mentioned with the flower beetle stuff, um, individuals differ in their um, ability or propensity to disperse. And so in that experiment, I actually didn't find any relationship between like body size, I, I measured body length and dispersal ability, but we see that a lot. So birds with larger wings will disperse farther distances. Um, species body size, yeah, wing size, some sort of genetic component. If you have a really good body condition, you might be more likely to disperse because like you can, you know, you can take it, I guess, which it's not really how that works, but, uh, and that determines two things about dispersal, that departure phase, meaning if the individual disperses, 
Remember our three phases of dispersal, departure, settle, or sorry, departure, transfer, and settlement. Um, so that is departure, the if an individual disperses, and then how far the individual disperses is the transfer component of dispersal. The second thing that can sort of muck up those dispersal um, kernels is the influence of climate. So abiotic factors, things like wind, temperature, um, rainfall can strongly influence the probability of dispersal at, at many of different of uh, sort of phases, right? And so it could influence the probability that you would disperse, which is, um, what, what did we call that? I just said it, the uh, departure phase of dispersal. Um, or it could also uh, influence how far you disperse your transfer or where you decide to settle and your probability of survival once settling. And so that settlement phase. And then the last thing that I talk about here is the uh, species dispersal is influenced by species interactions. I talked a little bit about that with my own work. Um, it's pretty clear. The example I give here is not competition, which is, is, is sort of mine. At both the, the beetle species were the same. They didn't eat each other. It was just they interacted via competition for a resource. However, if you were also, if you think about predation, um, that is a form of species interaction that you um, that you may want to try to avoid as a, as an individual in your dis uh, dispersal decisions. And so we briefly mentioned the influence of, of intraspecific density. Remember that intraspecific means within a species. And so I am an individual of this population. What influences my dispersal? Climate, other things. Also, the density of individuals of my same species around me. And so uh, this is called density dependent dispersal when your uh, dispersal probability or distance is a direct function of the density of individuals of your same species. Density independent dispersal is uh, when you don't really care about your own density. This normally happens with respect to uh, passively dispersed organisms. And so things that are wind dispersed don't really have a, too much of a say in uh, when they disperse. Same things of like animal vector things and things like that. And so those tend to be just uh, density independent. Meanwhile, active dispersers tend to be more density dependent. But there are also active dispersers that could not use cues on their own density. So that's not a strict line of passive dispersers are density independent and active dispersers are not are density dependent. We can't make that, that sort of hard line. So don't do that. <laughs> And then lastly, uh, there are things that make a disperser good, even within a population. We briefly mentioned that body size could be related to dispersal distance. Um, here I give, I think, three examples. Um, one, sex, the other one, body mass, and the last one, genotype. Meaning, so there's some genetics that might let you disperse farther. This is largely through traits. And so my genotype encodes my phenotype, meaning my genes encode how big and strong I am or my body size or something about um, my cold resistance. And that can relate to dispersal ability or tendency, propensity. Body mass, this is not strictly true, but larger individuals tend to disperse more readily. Uh, and then males also tend to disperse more readily. But I think this also has sort of counter examples in the literature. I'm not familiar with any of them, but I don't really study dispersal that much. All right. All right. Um, here I talk, I mean, this is a, the last two sections are more like pontificating and we can go over them in class. I'm not gonna go over them here. You can also read the notes on your own. The idea here is I'm saying, if you have good dispersers that have these qualities, right? If males tend to disperse farther, and you have a spreading population, the expectation there is that you should have more males on the outside edge of your population. So if this is geographic space and this is where your population exists and males can disperse from a central location out further, 
then toward the edge of this population, you should have more males than females. And then I talk a little bit about competition colonization trade-off. I don't know why I brought that up. That's gonna come into play later. I will go over that in class, not now, but I think we're already hitting um, like an hour or so, or maybe more. Um, and then the last little bit is on human modification, modifications to land use that influence dispersal. Um, and so roadways will increase mortality. Uh, yeah, they call it a roadkill. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I give the example of um, there's a snail that actually speciated into two different species because of a road construction because it couldn't disperse across the road. Um, and so dispersal pathways are strongly affected by humans. Um, there's one of the ways to get around this is the building of green bridges, if you've seen that, um, which are just like bridges that have grass on them to allow large ranged things to move and disperse and migratory things as well. Um, I also provide a funny video, let's hope the link is still active, of um, dispersal of fish and how to, how, to in, how to best show dispersal of fish or help dispersal of fish um, to get over like dams and things that they just wouldn't be able to get over otherwise. And so there's fish ladders and there's fish cannons. If I had to guess, I probably included a video of the fish cannon because that's funny. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to point out the idea of invasive species and that we don't just hinder dispersal. We also enhance dispersal sometimes. And so the nine-banded armadillo, I think in native to Louisiana, I'm not sure. I know it's native to Texas, maybe, maybe not native here, um, is now all the way up to like Missouri or higher. And that's because it, it walks along roadways um, to, in order to like sort of get over geographic barriers such as rivers and such. Um, and then I, the actual sort of active transport of things like zebra mussels and aquatic invasive species um, is a big problem, especially sort of ballast water. It's when a ship takes in a bunch of water in order to weight it down in order to get to a certain place after, and then it, you load stuff and it releases that water. So it's like a, a balance and that can move um, organisms really easily. So they've sort of stopped doing that. They, I think they either sterilize the water or do something. I don't know what they do. They do something though. And so I apologize that was a little long. We'll go over this in, in class in a little more detail, but um, yeah, thank you for staying tuned on the stochasticity and dispersal lecture. And I'll go ahead and stop sharing. And sweet, take care.